Hey guys, and welcome to Metro Waterproofing's anniversary podcast. We are celebrating 50 years, 50 years of serving clients, 50 years of serving employees, 50 years of giving back to the community. Uh, today we are here with the founders of Metro Waterproofing, Mr. Clyde Strickland and Miss Sandra Strickland, uh, these leaders and legends from our local community. Uh, if you listen to the first episode of this podcast as we were introducing the show, we got to hear Clyde tell the story of growing up in North Carolina from a tobacco farm all the way till 1972 when he founded Metro Waterproofing. And what a journey it is. Uh, really invite you guys to go back and listen to that full story. Today we have both Clyde and Sandra in the studio. And how are you guys doing today? We're doing, We're doing great. Wonderful. Good to be here. That's Thank great. you. I'm so excited to really get into this next leg of the story and the journey. Um, obviously, we're going to touch on some of the things that me and Clyde may have already talked about as he was coming up and really want to get into the story of Sandra growing up as well, leading us there. So uh, why don't we kick it off with you, Sandra? Why don't we kick it off with you? Tell us what it was like. Where did you grow up? And what was it like growing up as a, as a girl? Was it North Carolina? Were you in North Carolina? Yes, okay. North Carolina. Tell us that story. Well, I was actually born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, but we'd left there at a very early age. Um, but most of my lifetime was in Tarboro, North Carolina. But before then, as a little girl, we lived in, um, we had lived in Virginia, and we also had lived in um, different areas. So we moved a lot as I was a little girl, I can assure you that. But I remember starting school um, in Virginia, and it was, um, a housing project actually off a military base where our classrooms were. Life was real simple in those days. And we uh, grew up um, as a little girl, because I was really small at that time. I remember before I even started school very vaguely, but um, we I loved playing in the yard, playing with my brother. and kids in the neighborhood and the ice man coming by and we all would run after the ice truck and get chips of ice because we didn't have a refrigerator back then. We had an ice box. That's right. Right. So we had to put the ice and that was always a joy and fun for us to run after the, the ice truck. And also... Um, Love going to Bible school. The church bus would come back. But you got to remember back in the early times, people didn't have cars like they do now. We were lucky to have one car per family. But um, Daddy worked, and then I remember moving to um, from there um, to a place on the beach. And oh, wow. Mama and Daddy both were always doing something differently, and Daddy always loved working by himself. I remember they had a donut shop at one time, ice cream shop in, in Virginia. And Daddy always loved to deal with fruit. So to kind of push myself up a little bit, we I remember we moved back to Tarboro, North Carolina. That's a story in itself or purpose, but that's that's for another time. <laughs> but um, starting school, I always loved going to school, and we walked to school. The only disadvantage I had that this advantage today, I always wanted to ride the school bus because we lived in the city. Mm -hmm. If you lived in the city, you didn't get to ride on the school bus. You had to walk to school. Okay. Yeah. So at every corner, there was always, they call them truant officers back then, they would help us across the street till we got to the schoolhouse. But I remember mostly when we lived in um, Wilmington, Mama would walk with me to the school, and then she would meet me at the school, and we'd walk back home. And during that time when we lived there, that's when Hurricane Hazel came, and it flooded everything, and oh. we were only two blocks from where all the water was. So that was a disaster time, but mm. we, um, we remembered going through that, but we started back to school right away. But we moved from, I have to say, from place to place. I don't remember the time many times we have moved, but um, but I do remember um, when we lived in Wilmington, my brother and I would 
walk up. They had a bowling alley there, and they sold, like, Coca-Colas and different stuff. And so it was about three blocks from the house. And so as we were walking, I used to tell people, we didn't have a lot of money back then. So I was always looking at the ground and walking, and then we'd see a penny or a nickel, we'd pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one day... She still does that. (laughs) When we were walking... um, and there was a lot of scattered change, and we I started picking it up. But I always come in home, and I always put it in a little jar. Every time I would find a penny or a nickel, whatever, and put it in a jar and save it. But I have to say that I remembered one day, Daddy didn't have the money um, to take the bus to go to work. He was a carpenter at that time. And, uh, and I remember hearing Mom and Daddy talk, and so... I took my little jar and I took it to Daddy and I said, Daddy, I've got some money in this jar and it was enough and more where he can take the bus back then. Oh, wow. I always was a saver. And uh, for some reason, you know, during our time, we had some hard times during our day because Mother and Daddy both came during the time of the Depression and right out of the Depression. And I loved my grandmom and granddaddy so much and I remember we we lived in Norfolk at the time we would go and visit my grandmama and granddaddy in Tarbarrel and um but granddaddy and them had lost their farm in Rocky Mount they lost everything they had and the beauty of all of that though from the ashes I would always say um, that was a blessing to me because Grandmama loved to play the piano. They had a <laughs> the four piano. A That's piano. how you say it. Exactly. Uh-huh. And she um, played their accordion. She even had a little guitar. But they, only, they had to move to a mill house so they can have a job. And Granddaddy at that time, because of his age, he was a janitor. And so he would ride the mill bus to get to work and get back home. They did have a car. I remember it was one of those black, I call it an antique black car. Mm -hmm. But I loved riding in it. But um, Grandmama was always so special to me. And I had an aunt that lived with her. And I had a special aunt that loved me to death. And, And I loved her. We always got to play together. She was probably at that time at least um, 10, 12 years older than I was. But she loved everybody. But we were creative. We couldn't afford games. And I remember she would get Pepsi-Cola stoppers and Coca-Cola stoppers that came off of the drink. Mm -hmm. And we would make... um, games out of it like checkers and we'd take a piece of cardboard paper and we'd play checkers and the kids in the neighborhood always would come over we sit on the steps at night catch um lightning bugs and there'd be 10 or 12 of us gathered kids gathered in those days from the neighborhood mm. that's what we're missing today right and so but anyway through that and growing up i always loved school and I always loved singing, and I would go to church with, with Grandmama, but Mom and Daddy never really went to church, maybe twice a year. So I would go to churches with my friends throughout, and Grandmama, when I could, she okay. always took me. And I always loved going to church and learning the, the Bible. But throughout those period, I always loved going to school. And so when I was in the eighth grade, um, the band director came to the school because the teachers had said, we've got this girl, she really loves music, but I couldn't afford, you know, piano or anything like that. So he gave me an opportunity and said, we need a player in the band for high school. I was in the eighth grade, and I thought, how can I be in the band just taking one year? Uh-huh. And I was open to it. I was wow. so excited. I said, Oh, yes, and without knowing what instrument it uh-huh. was. I said, well, what instrument it is? He said, it's a baritone horn. I didn't know what a baritone <laughs> horn was. But I, I said, don't know that I still know what a baritone horn is. I know, horn. and I said, <laughs> it's yes. It's a big old boy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, yes. And so he would come to school twice a week, 
and I would get out of class, and um, that's how I learned play the horn, take it home, and practice, and drove all the neighbors crazy. Oh, wow. But, um, but it was fun, and that summer, he invited me to the high school to practice with the band, so I went and practiced with the band, and so as my freshman year of high school, um, I played this instrument and loved playing and loved learning, and became a part of the band. And they had a super band. We had a symphonic band and a marching band, and I was in both of them. And was so excited that that I was a part of that. And also uh, during that time when I was 16, this is before I met Clyde. I decided God was telling me that I needed to find a place that God wanted me to be a part of. And so I had always been to the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church of God, um, Pentecostal Church. So I've been to a lot of different churches. But this lady that was a customer of Daddy's at the fruit stand had invited me to come and help her in, in her Sunday school class because my goal was to be a school teacher. So I went and started helping her, and then I decided I wanted to attend the big church. They had a chapel, and so I went into the service, and it was so quiet. You could think. You couldn't hear a pin drop. You had time for prayer, to mm. meditate. Then all of a sudden, as the service started, the music was so wonderful. They had a choir there. But back then, the men all sat on the left side. All the women sat on the right, right. side. Yeah. And right. so anyway, but when they had the communion and the priest broke that wafer um, for his body was broken, something just came through my body. And it was like, God, this is it. This is the place. I feel your spirit so strong here. There's a purpose in my life. Wow. And so... That's when I, at that time, I got baptized and I joined the Episcopal Church and sang in the youth choir. They had a youth choir, and I joined the youth choir there and sang in the youth choir. And every now and then, they invited me to sing with the adult choir. And I just And how loved. old were you right then? I was 16, 16 at that okay. time. And my goal was, and I remember God, I know people, and I was one of those people, you go to church because of your friends. Mm -hmm. You go to church because of your parents or your grandparents. And I said, God, I want you to place me for where I need to be as your disciple. Mm. So that was the place. Yeah. And that's where I really began to learn so much about church history, the Bible history, um, what it meant to to really be a Christian. And... And this is the path that I wanted to take. And I said, God, just protect me and guide me all my life. So along the way, um, I was working with Daddy at the fruit stand. And so to tell you another part of the story, uh, I had just learned how to skate. Oh, Roller okay. skate. Roller skate. Yeah. And we didn't have... Um, uh, skating uh, there in Tarboro, but that summer they would come in and set up arena, and you can go and skate. So I wanted a pair of those white skates. My brother was a good skater, and he was teaching me how to skate. And so I was saving my money, my pennies, my nickels, and Dada would give me a little bit of allowance for working. And so I, I had opened up a bank account and started saving the money and um, finally bought me a pair of skates. And so I was learning how to skate and loved it. I didn't know how to skate backwards or do all those crazy things that skaters do. But you learned. I learned. Yeah, and my you, brother you learned. Was, you've been doing it. And my, my <laughs> brother was going to teach me how to back skate. So anyway, wow. then all of a sudden I'm working at the fruit stand and here comes this fella up and he's oh. buying some uh, peaches at that time. Uh -oh. And so he would talk. We'd chat a little bit. And then he asked me, say, hey, would you like to go on a date with me? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, I don't really know you. No. And so anyway, he'd come back a week later or whatever and chit-chat some more. But I have to tell you this thing. The first thing he ever said to me, how much of the eggs in China? <laughs> I thought, I thought, I'm 
I said, well, I don't you know what the price of the eggs is in Tarboro, North Carolina. How would I know what the price of eggs in China is? And I thought, what a strange question to ask somebody. And so I remember well, you when remember he, it now. I remember it's when tough. I asked my We're going to lie. How would he ask such a question as that? So anyway, come back again, ask me another date. Well, again, I said no. And I think about the fourth time, my mama finally told me, and she said, because she really liked him off the bat. And she said, well, I really think, why won't you date him? I said, well, Mama, he's older than I am. He just got out of the Army, you know. And I said, um, I can't believe you're telling me this. And she said, well, I know his family. And so when he came up the next time and he finally asked me, and, and I finally said, well, I tell you what, if you come to church pick me up and take me to church, uh -huh. um, then, you know, I'll go t to the movies with you because he wanted me to go to the movies. I'll do that. So we did that. And so it Good. was, he was such a gentleman, I have to say that. And um, Casanova. Just um, Casanova. opened the car door <laughs> for me. And the conversations that we had uh -huh. was just incredible. And I realized um how smart he was and um, and listened to his stories when he was in the military and as a, as a young man. So we dated. Um, but I have to say after that first date, he did not ask me for another date. Uh-oh. So, and I remember coming in and we were sitting on the steps that night and we were talking and when he left, he gave me a kiss on the cheek. Uh-huh. But Sweet. then after that, you know, well, I... I didn't give it another thought. I said, oh, well, that's just a date, you know. So finally, down the road, a couple of weeks, there he comes again. Uh -huh. And he brings me a milkshake. Uh -huh. I remember that. And so then he asked me for a date again. And so I did. So from then on, we dated pretty steadily. But I have to say, for my benefit and for Clyde, that we have always been about communication, we always knew how to talk to each other and shared each other's vision and goals with one another. And and I knew there was something different about him than the other guys that I had dated. I had dated a um, a neighbor across the street and he was a football player and I had I had dated other guys, but I was really not into dating a lot, Nathan, because I had a goal in my life and that goal was to study hard because I would get involved in high school, um, and I took four years to home ec, and I joined whatever I could. I was active within my church, and I had my homework to do. But I always had, we didn't date every night back then like people do now. And right. so when Clyde and I were going to date, my daddy would say on Sunday night, well, you know, they call me Jean, she has to be home at 8 o'clock on Sunday. So Clyde worked during the week, and I didn't date during the week. So Saturday night was the time to date because I worked mm -hmm. uh, with Daddy and the business um, during my summertime. But along the way, I, we, you know, fell in love, and um, yeah. we dated. Uh, within six months, she proposed to me. I was a senior in high school at that time. And so anyway, um, I said yes, and so... I had a week of freedom from high school. We had planned the wedding because where he worked at, they only uh -huh. got a week for vacation out of work. Uh -huh. So we wanted to go on a honeymoon. And so that's how we scheduled our wedding day wow. while yeah. he was on uh, vacation for a week. So from then on, we journeyed. I mean, we had a life, let me tell you. We, I didn't know from one month to another where we were going to do, where we were going to live. And I had, <laughs> where I had applied for a job at Glenmore, Glen, uh, Glenmore there in Tarbor. That's where Clyde worked. And so, um, but when I had a scholarship offered to me from East Carolina in a music, of all things, music mm -hmm. scholarship. But I thought that would give me an opportunity to, to become a teacher. Uh -huh. And so then I had another scholarship that had been offered to me. And um, But I had worked hard during school and studied hard, did not take any business courses. It was all courses that I would need for college. And I took one year of typing my senior year because that was a requirement that you had to know typing. So 
didn't take any business, took two years of French and just all this stuff that, you know, you you think you need and you did need if you go to college. But when you get married and you all of a sudden you're out going to be about in the business world, Mm -hmm. because I did turn down the scholarship. I went to the counselor and I told her that I'm getting married and that um, that I wasn't. I wanted this scholarship to give to somebody uh-huh. that can use it. And so anyway, my godmother wow. was upset over that at that time. She said, you need to go to college. And I said, well, I'm, I'm the first to graduate from high school, and that's the blessing in my family. Wow. And I said, and I feel like that this is, this is a goal that God has for me mm-hmm. somehow or another. And so she accepted that. My mom and daddy accepted it. And I never forget when the night before the wedding, daddy was in my room and he said to me, he said, are you sure this is what you want to do? Do you, you, you love him more than you love me? I said, Dad, why are you asking me that question? Mm-hmm. I love you. You know that. I love Clyde, but it's it's a different love. And don't you know that with mama, the difference, you know? Mm-hmm. and. He just wanted to make sure. But Daddy never stepped his foot a lot into the church. He went to rehearsal dinner that night. We went to rehearsal dinner. Right after that, we left for the rehearsal. We didn't have dinner. We left there and went straight to work that Friday. (laughs) And um, our wedding was that Saturday. We were leaving Saturday, headed out on our honeymoon, and... People don't understand that, but that was pretty common in in my day. Mm-hmm. So we had a beautiful reception at church. Um, then we left there. We hit the road, but that's great. I tell you, it's been a journey. So we have been in a lot of different places during this time, and I think we figured it out one time when we started Metro Waterproof, and they had asked me to give a report. So I was I never get in the warehouse. Somehow I started. Researching, and we, Clyde and I, had moved at that point. We were in our 13th house. There you go. When we settled in. Now, 13 is a big number for you guys. Yeah. That's a lucky number. It's a a lucky number. Yeah, we lived from Tarboro, North Carolina, moved to Morganton, North Carolina, where I worked there, Mm -hmm. and left Morganton, had moved up to Rossville, Georgia. We moved. to Casey, and so we've been everywhere, and then to to back to Morganton, which I loved Morganton, and then we moved um, here. How we moved to Charlotte? To uh, from to Charlotte, we were there for a couple of years and left there, and moved to Duluth, Georgia, mm-hmm. from Duluth to Lawrenceville, and we've settled in Lawrenceville, been there ever since 1971. Okay. So I want to go back a little bit and just uh, hit a couple things in in your story. Really, that I think that moment of saving those pennies and and you were saving and and you saved it up and then you heard of the need that your dad had and then you gave that money. That was a moment that stuck with you in a big way. I could see that being a foundational moment for you that God would use in the future because you probably got a lot of joy out of like being able to provide that for your dad. Yeah. I got a part of my story. I feel I need to tell. Okay. But I may struggle with it a little bit. Sure. And I don't know um, because I think that has a lot to be do with who I am, where I am. Um a handful of people only know about this, Nathan. It's about my daddy. Um, when I was a little girl, um, I remember living in Virginia as a little girl and mom and daddy. First, I want to tell you, I respect my daddy so much. Mm-hmm. And I love him. Um but there was a time in our life when I was little, I remember staying with, um, we had moved, somehow or another, mother and I had moved to Tarboro with my grandparents. Well, and I went, started school there. 
And um, mom and daddy, daddy became an entrepreneur and he had his own business and he knew a lot of the business people in town and all of this. Mm -hmm. And I always loved tutoring children. So um, when I was in high school, um, I helped, I had a neighbor that she was from Greece and she had these three children and her husband, the children's daddy, had owned a um, restaurant in Tarboro and he would walk to work every day. Just wonderful people. And the next door neighbor to them, she was a school teacher and um, she helped me at times and we just had good neighbors. Just, just, just a good environment I had. Uh, great teachers at school, good neighbors, um, and all of that. Daddy had had a fish market in Tarboro and a fruit stand, and um, but he always had doing work of his own. He was a great carpenter. But one day I was next door working with the children, and I always came out back, and when I was coming to my house, there was like three or four cops Mm. in the backyard, had a pistol at my daddy. And um, I was startled, and I'm, I'm looking, and daddy said, because he was bagging coal at that time, he'd been working in the backyard, and he said, go in the house. So I went in the house, I said, Mama, what's going on? Well, she, she didn't know at that point, and so... She used to stay in here, and then she came back, and they took my daddy up to the um, police station. And so mom and, dad, mom and I went down there, and um, daddy had been an escaped convict. Oh, my goodness. For about eight or nine years. Hmm. I did not know that. Did it your mom just, know that? He My thought mom. he dated it. She thought he was uh, off in school. I, I didn't know. They'd tell her he was in college. I did not. Well, the, to make a long story short, um, I remember when I was little, uh, just in the first grade in Tarboro, mm -hmm. my um, aunt said, your mama's coming to get you. Because I knew mama was gone. I thought she was with, um, with um, I didn't you know, didn't know, and she said um, to go to your daddy. I thought, well, daddy had been working out of town. Mm -hmm. So my brother, mother came and got us, so we took the bus, went to Wilmington. That's how we happened to live in Wilmington, North Carolina. And daddy was there, and he. I remember we were going shopping and all this. Well, that I didn't know at that time, but that was the time that he escaped from prison, which mm -hmm. was the state penitentiary uh, in Richmond, Virginia. But the part of the story was that day when Daddy was arrested, the police officer told Mama, don't let her go to school tomorrow because it's going to hit the news. Oh, my goodness. And so anyway, I remember when I was home, I didn't go to school the next day, but I did go the next. I said, Mama, I'm going to school. And... Um, but it didn't hit the paper that day. It hit the next day. Um, it's a big write-up. Daddy was pretty well known. Daddy liked to gamble, and he would gamble with the um, business owners and that sort of thing. And we knew just about it. I mean, everybody knew to everybody in mm -hmm. town. And um, But I remember I, when I went to school, I didn't know what to expect. I was in the band. I was active. Um, and there were some shoulders. I think people didn't know what to say to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember, um, I have to say, people were wonderful to us. In fact, during that time, people got a petition together because Daddy had was a good reputation those years. And I kept wondering, I said, how come he wasn't found? I mean, here we were, we were living, his mom and daddy was in Tarbor. I never could figure none of this out, mm -hmm. but somehow or another, I don't, I don't know how that part happened. 
But um, the petition got signed, I remember, and Daddy um, got out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he came home, I was still in high school at that time. But that's at 16, that's when I felt like I needed to find a place for me to mm -hmm. worship. And God had blessed me from that. But also, mm -hmm. um, Clyde came along right after that. That time, I was real cautious about dating. Um, I was real cautious about um, my family. My brother ended up sure. quitting school so he can help Mama. That's when Daddy went back mm -hmm. to, to prison. And... Um, I had the opportunity. I went to work with the neighbor next door, but Daddy had told Mama, don't bring her to see me and don't let her work in, as a waitress. I mean, there was something back then, don't be a waitress. So um, anyway, I think that had a big impact on my life. Sure. That I learned mm -hmm. that I had a passion for people, always had. And I remember... When I would, as a little girl, walk into school back and forth, we didn't have a whole lot. And I, I realized Daddy wouldn't let me spend the night with people. Um, and I think he always was protective of me, very protective. Sure. And I remember when I was in the first grade, I went to the drugstore with my brother. And I took a bag of candy home. And this was before I started school. My brother was out walking, and so I took out this little piece of candy, Mama saw it, and she said, where'd you get that? I said, well, I got it at the store. Well, how'd you get it? Well, I picked it up. She took me and marched me all the way back to <laughs> yeah, the right. drugstore to return that bag right. of candy. Yeah. And so they were always, like, teaching me the right thing. And uh -huh. I think a lot of this had to do because of my daddy. Sure. And my daddy didn't want me to be anything like that. Sure. Absolutely. So everything was always honest and upfront, but I always had a passion for people because you don't know footsteps or the pathway mm -hmm. that people take mm -hmm. of what their life was about. Oh, because yes. I asked myself, do you know me? Do you really know me? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's what Klein, I had a relationship. He can tell me about his farm life. Growing up, he had a hard time. I could share with him my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what has meant that we understood each other. We understood each other's background. Right. And um, we moved forward in our life. And we wanted, my dream was to always live in a little white house with the porch, with two rocking chairs. Just have a good family. It mm. wasn't about material things. It didn't take us a lot of money. I know Clyde always had, his thing has always been, Nathan, it was to have a new car. Uh -huh. Here I am, we got married, I didn't even drive. I took driver's ed at school, but I didn't drive because we walked everywhere we went, so we got married, I didn't drive. and So finally it was time that I learned how to drive. And so anyway, I did, got my license and everything and started driving. And um, I remember my daddy, when he was 52, when he passed away, mother never drove. And I remember the phone call, she called me, and she said, well, guess what I'm doing today? I said, what? She said, I'm taking driver's ed. <laughs> There's a lot in my life. I got her a brand new car the first three months. First three months. <laughs> I knocked her off her feet. <laughs> and, uh, but it was still never in material things. It was more like having character. Sure. That was the most important thing. I mm -hmm. wanted the character. Now, Clyde had character. Mm. I wanted that in my children, and I wanted them to grow up uh, knowing that they were going to go to college, that education was important. And I believe that education, even with me in my life, what I took in school, Mr. Brand, uh, when I went to uh, Morganton when I worked for Mr. Baran in a department store. He would always come by. I was either, I was always there dusting the clothes and whatever, and you had dress up back then when you worked in the department store, and he would come by, always speak to me, good morning. And then one day he called me into his office, 
And he said, I've got this opportunity. I want you to work in the bookkeeping department, I thought. I said, Mr. Chapel, I never took those kind of classes in school. I always just took mm -hmm. what I needed. He said, I gamble with you and I take a chance on you. And I do remember when I started learning that when they were training me, I'd go home and I'd tell you, I'll be at, just before we had children, I said, I'll be at the table taking notes on this machine that we had and all of this. He was sitting at the table with me and, uh, Oh, I knew I wasn't going to get the job. I, I knew it. And I said, well, that'll be okay. So anyway, I remember he called me into the office, and the girl that was training me, she said, and Mr. Chapel, there's no way that I would have ever thought Sandra would learn how to do this. But she's the hardest working girl I have ever seen. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. And um, the girl that had the job had a college education. I didn't. Mm. But I had fortitude, and he recognized that. And so um, there you go. when they gave me the opportunity, that, that, that was in God's plan. Yes. Because I didn't know at the time when I started doing uh -huh. that, all of a sudden I, I was it. loving uh -huh. what I was okay. doing. There you go. Clyde comes in and say, oh, guess what? <clears throat> We're moving. <laughs> That's when we went to Roswell. He was in the uh, tech textile at that time but we've had a wonderful journey during our life and there was just i mean I, it's gonna be a whole book of pages of of the different things that we did but there sure. was a blessing in each one uh -huh. from the small house that we bought mm -hmm. when we got married and i think clyde told you that story from the time that we moved on and from the time we moved to duluth mm -hmm. And the church that we join here, we've, it's just been a journey. It's hard to really tell the story. Sure it is. You got ups, you've got downs, and every down is taking you to another level. Yeah, another level. Been. And you're taking something from each part each of the story. Each part of it. And you know that God's the writer of our stories and that you guys both recognize that. Just recognizing that is a is a skill and an asset that you learn over time because well, you, he writes those sto those things into our story and we take all those because you know you thank you for sharing your your dad's story and growing up there and that opens up your eyes to um to a lot of what other people deal with every single day and god knew at the very beginning uh, what you guys were going to do for communities and people that are hurting and people who uh, are going through issues and different things. And uh, he gave you early eyes to be able to see those things and, and know that there's a need to be met. And, and he uses our stories to get us there. That's the one thing that I can say as a little girl when I was very young. Um, mother taught me my prayers. I still say it every night. I add it to it before I go to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep. Mm. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I praise the Lord my soul to take. How much better ending to a prayer can you get after you thank him for all the things he's done that day? Mm -hmm. And also pray for people that need your prayers. And I still end with my, that prayer. And then she taught us the table. You know, when, when we sat at the table, even though they didn't go to the church, mm -hmm. we always said our blessing. Mm -hmm. God is great. God mm -hmm. is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. That daily bread is so precious. Mm -hmm. And then when you, it's always, and then the Lord's Prayer. I don't remember when I learned the Lord's Prayer. It was always, as that little girl growing up, we always knew those things. And mm -hmm. now people are not learning the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like the national anthem and different stuff. And I well, had the right privilege and opportunity growing up in a school system where they had prayer before we started class. The teacher would read a little devotion. We get mm. these little Bibles that we can take home, and we uh, and that was my my Bible was that little book we got at school. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, Clyde wow. and I would talk about the Lord, and it just always was a part of who we were. And um, Clyde always believed in prayer, and we just had so much in common. 
But this man is gifted that's sitting here beside me, and I recognize that, and I believe with all my heart that God had a plan and a purpose. We're not perfect people. And when we become Christians, you know, we still sin every day. Mm-hmm. But somehow or another, you know, and, and when you're baptized, God knows that. He didn't pick perfect disciples. If you look at each one mm-hmm. of them, they all had their faults. But I have to say, their life didn't turn around until Jesus died on that cross and he rose again from the dead, when his disciples saw that, their lives turned around, mm. and they went out and made churches and disciples. And I believe that's kind of where Clyde and I come in at, that, that we're all his children. Right. He loves us all. He loves the sinner. He loves... My daddy just as much as he loves me. That was me. a great, that's a that's great, right. when she said that, that triggered something in my mind uh, that has to do with the church of how we got Metro Waterproof and started. We were, just had started to uh, St. Edward's in Lawrenceville. We were just, we got there the second Sunday and uh, about a year into the church, uh, Ms. Strickland of the Strickland House in Duluth, she got, uh, I think she was the first federal judge in Georgia. And uh, she won't write it uh, uh, related to us, but I would go to her house and clean her gutters and clean her yard. Back then I was real energetic and uh, I loved to help people. And so and so she said, she couldn't got what she couldn't drive. So she said, I could just ride to church with you and send her. This was all God's plan. So we ride in the church one Sunday, and uh, she said, Clyde, I got this piece of property on Old Peachtree Road over here. She said, uh, I need some money. My money's running short, and I need some money, and I need to sell this piece of property. And uh, she said, do you know somebody that might come buy it? I said, well, I don't know, but we're buying a house in Lawrenceville, and uh, this guy builds houses, Charles Moore, and he builds houses all over. And so I talked to Charles Moore, and, and uh, me and him rode over there, a beautiful piece of property, 107 acres, a lot of property. Wow. And so uh, he said, well, i tell you what i do. I'll, uh, I'll give her $1,000 an acre. Think about this now. That's how far back it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was se- uh, 71. And uh, she said, I'll, uh, it was seven, 1971. And she said, I'll give you $200 an acre off of your house. So we, the house was 41000 It went down to 20 thousand. Plus he put carpet and fixed the yard, all wow. kinds of stuff extra. Mm-hmm. And so when we got ready to start Metro Waterproofing, we thought we could borrow some money from the bank. We, we only had uh, $2,700 in the bank. And uh, $3,500, and I paid 2700 to the Bank of Duluth. I thought I could borrow $10,000 the next day. Right. Well, they found out I was going in business. They wouldn't loan me nothing. Oh, yeah. So here's the point that God <laughs> had given us that equity in a house. Uh-huh. So we go and borrow a second mortgage on a house. That's how we started Metro Waterproofing. If we hadn't have took that ride wow, yeah. That's to true. church, yeah. Metro Waterproof wouldn't exist. Wow. And it's all that's in a, God's plan. Unbelievable. That's, that's, that's great. I want to pause right there, guys. Um, this has been an incredible episode of the show where we've really gotten to hear Sandra's story and the very beginnings of Metro Waterproofing. Uh, we are going to be right back in the next episode as we get into the conversation with Clyde and Sandra as we talk about the early days of starting Metro Waterproofing. Uh, subscribe, share, Tell all your friends, um, this is an incredible show. You're going to hear some incredible stories about how God moved to really create a company that he would work through for the last 50 years.